Hi everyone, today I'm here to tell you about a blooper in the middle of the Moss Eisley Cantina that nobody's noticed in the last 45 years. Uh, but first I need to explain that there were actually three locations for the Moss Eisley Cantina. When people think of uh, Moss Eisley and Tatooine, they think of Tunisia where all the exteriors were shot. Uh, but actually none of the interiors were filmed there, even though this is the place where fans uh, go on a pilgrimage to pay homage to this scene. All the interiors were, for principal photography, were filmed in Elstree Studios in England and that's where I was involved in this sequence. Later on in post-production uh, in the USA they also did insert photography for the same scene where they shot some of the interiors of the alcoves that helped to pad out the scene and make it more interesting. Here you can see my uh, contract for that first Star Wars. I started the movie on the 8th of March 1976 and they paid me the princely sum of £65 a week which is about $95 for five weeks. You can see me in this photograph in this rather snazzy sweater that looks incredibly dated now, uh, standing with um, some of the characters that we built uh, for principal photography and some of the other members of our team. I'll tell you more about those characters uh, in another video. So be sure you subscribe otherwise you're going to miss that. For now, let me start by outlining some of the other crew members that I worked with on Mus Eisley because the, for many decades the majority of them were ignored by Lucasfilm and the Lucasfilm archive. So first of all, there was my boss Stuart Freeborn who was the mastermind behind all the creatures for principal photography. He did get uh, quite a lot of publicity and he had made the apes for 2001 A Space Odyssey and it was that technology that Chewbacca was based upon. Stuart Stuart's son Graham uh, sculpted most of the cave reaches that you see in this photograph. Uh, uh, Stuart's wife Kay, she was mainly a makeup artist. She would look after Chewbacca when he was on set and other principal characters like Carrie and uh, Peter Cushing. Now someone who's not in this photograph is Charles Parker. He was uh, really a very well established uh, makeup artist at the time and done a lot of uh, great movies in his own right. Uh, uh, and he came in to sculpt the uglies, that's prosthetics for all those characters you saw around the bar that were deformed in some way. Robin Grantham is the guy that you see kneeling there. He was leaving when I was arriving, so I'm not 100% sure of everything that he did, but he certainly was involved in Greedo's eyes, and you can see him uh, working on that in one of these photos. Uh, Chris Tucker was also, later on, went on to become well-known for doing Elephant Man. He sculpted Pondo and he sculpted uh, the Plutonian and several other characters that you'll learn more about uh, in other videos. And lastly, uh, there's myself. I made the eyes for the majority of characters for the principal photography. Uh, I made uh, foam latex skins for Chewbacca. I foamed the prosthetics for the ugly makeups. Uh, in fact, uh, the smoker at the end of the bar was my first on screen prosthetic aesthetic uh, makeup. I was kind of proud of that. And I also applied the warts to Greedo and made his tasseled mohawk and sculpted the hands that were eventually used for Pondo. So now we get to the point of this particular video. Hands were an issue for this scene. You know, there were only six of us in the workshop and we only had five weeks to create a hive of scum and villainy. And we were focusing on the heads. Hands were largely overlooked and hands from other projects like 2001 uh, got used wherever it was possible to save us having to make anything new. So a week or two before filming, Stuart got me to sculpt up these hands uh, for the fly creature known as Spizzit. I made kind of sucker cups, big suckers that a fly might use to you know, stick to a wall or walk on a surface. Uh, but those hands were used for a lot of other characters too. Some I cut uh, finger shapes into the, the round of the sucker to uh, make them look uh, a little different. And Pondo, who was uh, at that time known as Warrior, man was one of the characters who ended up with these hands. 
Now, originally, the fight with Luke and Obi-Wan was written to be between the rodent and the fly, with some special action from the praying mantis. Now, my boss Stewart was born in 1914, and his concepts of aliens was not exactly what you might think of today. And the majority of creatures that he had us build were significantly terrestrial. You know, we're talking about a fly and a rodent and a praying mantis. And George Lucas was looking for something that was a lot more way out. And so he was picking out the characters that looked uh, a little more unusual. To be honest, the praying mantis didn't work very well and the rat looked too small and puny for this kind of rough sequence. And so the fight got changed to what we irreverently called the multi-eyed blob. You can see he's got my hands too. Now, in the novel, that change to the multi-eyed blob was also reflected. You can see in this print where it says, he found himself confronted by the large squarish monstrosity of multiple eyes and indeterminate origin. Whether from the conversation it was having with the like creature or the overdose of booze, the apartment house of wayward eyeballs was obviously growing agitated. Well, the multi-eyed blob had a insignificant mouse that uh, wasn't going to work well with any dialogue and whether it was for that reason or, or something else it was finally changed again to be Pondo who was one of the more unusual characters and uh, one of the uglies who later became known as Dr. Esteban. You'll see in this photograph the two of them with their guns trained on Obi-Wan. You know, this is a shot that was taken in rehearsal, I believe, because I don't see a big sucker hat holding that uh, pistol there. And that became really the issue that this video is all about. When Pondo was allotted my sucker hands, none of us knew he would end up in the fight. You can see the sucker hands in these photos. They're even in the comic books too. But after the fight action, they wanted a shot of the arm on the floor with a pistol to justify why Obi-Wan had cut off his arm. And later, they realized that a huge sucker couldn't actually squeeze a trigger or fire a pistol. So in post-production in the USA, they replaced that shot of the arm that I built with a hairy wolfman hand instead. All these years, the majority of fans haven't noticed that uh, Pondo's hand transforms the moment that it's cut off his body. Amongst those inserts that they did, they also did a shot of Pondo's head having been cut off, which was really rather bloody, and they had bladders in the neck, so it sort of pulsated and that was definitely over the top for Star Wars. Uh, you know, Star Wars has virtually no blood in it. And, uh, and, you know, let's be honest, a lightsaber should cauterize the cut as soon as it makes contact and stop any bleeding. So that was scrapped from the movie. Something similar to Pondo's arm happened to Greedo too. Now, you can see in this photo, actor Paul Blake rehearses the confrontation with Han Solo in one of the alcoves. Greedo at this time was not known as Greedo. He was on the call sheet simply as Alien. Not even the Alien, just Alien. At the time, uh, there were five of these creatures that we had built that were pretty much the same, and we called them the Martians. And nobody knew that one of them would be chosen to be the bounty hunter trying to kill Han Solo, and they too suffered from inadequate hands. We thought these guys would be in the background. And someone, it wasn't me, I promise you, came up with this bright idea of uh, sculpting sucker finger ends to go on washing up gloves. Well, what a disaster that was to put on a key featured character. You can see in these photos what a tangled mess those fingers became holding a pistol. So again, in post-production, they changed those hands for something more practical. Completely different hand for the inserts to the one used for principal photography, and nobody noticed that change either. So those are the bloopers in the Mos Eisley Cantina. Another day I'll tell you more about that scene and how it became such an icon of the classic Star Wars trilogy. But that's a story for another day, and as Yoda would say, subscribe you must, or miss it you will. This is Creature Effects designer Nick Maley saying, I'll see you again next time.
Make sure you subscribe and ring the bell or you may miss our next video about making Star Wars and practical creature effects told by people who were actually there.